scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 47, and verse number 50. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 47, and verse number 50. And I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Matthew writes, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good unto the vessels but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I read Matthew chapter 13, verses 47, verse number 50. Let us be led in prayer. I really love the Lord.
you're not going to intentionally sin or be a habitual sinner. So he's not saying that you can't sin. Just know there's a difference between one who sin and one who keeps on sinning. So those who continue to intentionally or habitually sin, he's saying they're of the devil. That's the thing that we need to see. There's some people who we keep seeing the same thing over and over again. You watch it on TV. That's of the devil. I don't care how many times they say they go to church. That which we see is that of the devil. So in other words, God's children are known by how they live. Just as Satan's children are known by how they live. So verse number 38 of Matthew 13. Jesus also lets us know that the field itself is the world. But he's not saying it's the church. Now understand, in Matthew 13, he says the field is the world. So what I want you to understand, he's not talking about the church here. The gathering of the harvest represents the end of the world, and those gathered in the harvest will be the angels and not men. So in other words, there are going to be some people we're going to have to deal with in this world that are straight down. But it's not your job to get rid of them. I don't care how much we see, it's not our job to go and remove them. Because remember, in verse number 40, Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels out, and they will gather his kingdom of all the things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. And he will cast them in the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the son of the kingdom of the Father. Of their Father, he who has ears, let him hear. So, remember Jesus said, if you were, well, he talked to the farmer and said, they weren't here before. Should we go ahead and pull them up? He says, no, because if you pull them up, you may pull up the wheat as well. So in people in our mindset, we feel like we can go get all of that people. But you don't know who is the good and who actually is the bad. So Jesus let you know, we're going to have to live in this world with some wicked people. So from this parable, one can ask himself, why would Jesus, knowing how wicked folks are going to be like we have today, knowing how bad they're going to come, how bad they're going to be, and how much they're going to continue to do evil, why is he not coming in judgment against the sons of the wicked one? These are things that I was trying to, I want to address last week, but people was, I got tired of hearing about the flag thing, but we have to ask ourselves, why would Jesus wait? What is he waiting on? We, we see all, the world keeps saying it's worse and worse and worse. We know that, but if you look at the text a little bit closer, verses 28 and 30, you can see something that Jesus might be referring to that's going to help us understand. He said to them, an enemy had done this, and the servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. Now I showed you the initial part, where if you do that, you may put them up. But if you look at it from a different angle, maybe, just maybe, God is giving you and me and other Christians, sons of the kingdom, time to grow together. Let's think about it. They are growing together. He said, let them grow together. Some of us ain't where we ought to be. But thank goodness we ain't where we used to be. So in essence, God may be just waiting to let you grow a little bit better and more knowledge of Jesus Christ instead of just plucking everybody up. Because some of us, I know I continually need to continue to grow in Christ. So looking at it, if he says, let them grow together, he's saying, you may need to be strengthened from where you are. So it was Jesus' concern out of the wheat that they may be destroyed by, the, by pulling up the tears. So Jesus was saying, no, let them grow together. So in other words, we as a church, we have to continue to grow even in the midst of what's going on you can't be the same person you was last year. Don't quit making the, the New Year's resolutions. New me, New Year, new me. And it's the same old, same you from two years ago. Keep moving. Or God is showing his long suffering. If he's letting the wheat and the tares grow together, 
then God is showing some long suffering. And he's showing it, notice he's showing it to the weak and the test, he's showing it to all men and giving all men the chance and the time to repent and obey the gospel. 2 Peter 3, chapter verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long suffering toward Man. us. Man. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He didn't say some. He's long suffering. So, what I want you to get from this is that we have to understand that we're going to have to live with some wicked folk in this world. And these folk are not the children of the kingdom. But understand, Jesus got this. He's going to deal with them. Now, some people may get away with stuff now, but there's going to come a day where he's going to do some separating. What you want to make sure is you're not counted as a goat, but rather counted as a sheep. So what I'm saying is, we have to expect the world to be the way it is. We can pray and pray and pray, Lord, do it. We want peace. You, it's good that you pray for peace, but pray for inner peace first. Because sometimes the things around you will make your mind when you can't sleep at night. Because the things you keep seeing, you just think, what's going on? So ask for peace first. Now, if we understand this, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Hopefully it's correctly in alphabetical order. These are things or ungodly behavior that we as Christians ought to expect the world to do. I understand the things that I'm getting ready to bring up is in Mark 7 chapter verses 21 through 23, Romans 1st chapter verses 29 through 31, Galatians 5th chapter verses 19 through 21, let's just start clicking in a minute, Colossians 3rd chapter verses 5 through 8, and 1st Corinthians 6 chapter verses 9 and 10. I'm going to take a survey of all these things that the world does that we should not be alone. These are carnal and sinful behaviors, and I got to say this because the lesson is going to deal with a lot of this. The world will be abusers of oneself with mankind. Homosexuality. Hmm. Sound for me? There will be an adultery, an evil eye, anger, backbiters, blasphemers, bolsters, covenant breakers, covetousness. Y'all remember covetousness, which is an extreme love or desire or reverence to loving something or someone more than God. We can see that from that flag thing. People put more reverence. Yep. They'd rather kneel to the flag. They won't kneel to pray. Keep yeah. going. Debaters. We're talking about people that love to argue. Deceivers. Folk are deceiving folk all the time. The Pons brought up this morning in Sunday school. Uh, give me, uh, you give me 200 and I give you 20,000. Yeah. That's a deceiver. Despisers of that which is good. There are people that don't like to see good or even brown people that do good. Despiteful, disobedient, disobedient to parents, drunkards, implemented. Y'all know what that is. Men having or displaying characteristics regarded as typically being a woman. So men acting funny. But if you want to take the text as well and flip it, the same principle is women trying to look more like me. Emulations, which is stirring up jealousy in other folks. There are some people, you see what he's wearing? Where do you think he got that from? They're not really gossiping. They're just trying to say, trying to keep up mess with you so you can be jealous of what he got. Emulations, envious, evil, man, lusting. I ain't gonna use that big old word here. Evil thoughts, extortions. And extortions, when I saw the word, I was like, what does that mean? One who obtains something by force, violence, intimidation, or authority, or by illegal means. Talking about people that are false accusers, liars, y'all know who those are. Fierce, filthy communications. If you watch anything on TV, is there any cuss word that ain't uh, sacred anymore on TV? We're talking regular TV, not HBO, not Cinemax. What's that other one? Not Showtime. Regular TV. You even got people saying cuss words. <laughs> Keep it moving. In higher offices. Foolishness. Fornicators. Haters of God. Hating one another. Hard-headed people. Heresies. And heresies are teaching things 
that are against the word of God that actually the world teaches. The word teaches. You got people that are telling you that Jesus was just nothing but a prophet. He didn't die. What else did the man say? Uh, he got you home. The people got you home believing in a God. He ain't no God. He was just a prophet. But somebody named Muhammad tells me, okay, teaching something the Bible doesn't teach. High-minded. Arrogant folk, prideful folk, these are, these are the things of the world, idolaters, implacable. Implacable means this is people that refuse to be persuaded. You can tell them the truth, they acknowledge the truth, say yes, it's the truth, and they turn around and use that conjunction, but. Folks that refuse to be persuaded, incontinent, folk that lack self-control, they just do whatever they want to do. In order to affection, people have, um, um, it just simply means, that's what I'm saying, <coughs> evil desires. You just, you look forward to doing something dirty, doing something wrong to people. Inventors of evil things, for a person to sit up and contemplate and then set out a plan, go to a hotel, bring all that stuff up, put it up, set it up, and do that, that in itself is the inventor of evil things and even carrying it out. Lasciviousness, which is obscene and indecent behavior. Now think about this. These are things that the world does. Then we need to be mindful that that's what they're doing. Then there is we have the lovers of flesh, lovers of their own selves, liars, maliciousness, malignity, which is wickedness and deliberate ill will towards someone. Murderers. Proud people, revelings, revelings, as I said before, is basically partying to the point where the end result is sexual immorality. Drinking, getting toe up, music, dark place, building, dancing, club, God can say what you want to. Anyway, then there are seditions. Seditions is conduct or speech or writings inciting people to rebel against the government. Doesn't that sound like the world? Now he's, now he's talking about Christians ought to not to be doing this, but things of the world. Serving various lusts and pleasures, sorcerers. Let me have a free reading. All these people that are sorcerers, did they not see they were not going to jail? Moving right along. Strife, fighting for superiority, thieves, traitors, truth traces, unclean, unholy, unmerciful, unrighteous, unthankful. Variance. Variance is one who sows disharmony because of a difference of nature, difference of opinion, or difference of interest. You got people in the church who are variants. They're telling you, you remember that? Because y'all seen that one guy, he says he's in church, he's telling you in guard day. The flag is more important. And he just said he don't care what nobody says. And I'm thinking, you're supposed to be a Christian. But he was putting more emphasis on the flag in his worship service than he was about. God. Those are various. Thieves, traitors, uh, whisperers. What are whisperers? We all read that before. Those who gossip and slander people in secret. Those are the ones that call on the phone. Girl, have you heard? Did you see him? You see how long he hugged her? He hugs us to give us from an angle, but he hugs us the male from the side, other side. But you see, you're whispering. What I'm saying is, these are people that are supposed to be of the world. Wickedness, witchcraft, without natural affection. When you hear the word na without natural affection, let me make sure I correct this. It's not saying homosexuality. That's not what natural affection is. It's actually speaking about folks who basically don't have a natural and instinctive affection for their own kinfolk. Someone who would, who doesn't love their own child. You mom had the baby and has no love for the child. That's without natural affection, natural. Without understanding and finally wrath. And we know wrath is when people finally go ahead and do what they were thinking about doing. So all those things we know mankind can, will do, and has done. So we shouldn't be shocked or taken by surprise when we see that behavior, right? Now here's the thing. But God still extends his grace and his mercy for every person born on this earth. Even though he knows that they're going to do it, 
because there's no one here so far gone that they cannot be saved. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that shall come to repentance. So God's a just God. He's a merciful God and he's a loving God. So while God's justice requires judgment and destruction of ungodly men, 2 Peter 3, chapter verse 27, his love and mercy is still giving, still willing to give people a chance to repent. A guy by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer, mm -hmm. eight people, did a whole bunch of other stuff that are necessary. Just Google it if you want to know. He went to jail. Everyone wrote him off. Somebody in the church still went and talked to him. And that man was baptized. And as far as we know, he was added to the church. And when people killed him, we know where he's going later on. So no one is so far gone that they cannot be saved. Unless they want, they're willing to say, I have won no parts of God. So Romans 2, second chapter, verse number 4, lets us know that God so long suffered. That his grace and mercy is designed to encourage people to repent. His long suffering is trying to get people to say, you know what? I still have time. God ain't erasing off the face of the earth with all the things that I've done. Then you know what? I'm still here for a reason. But for those people who despise and ignore and refuse God's long suffering, Romans 2 chapter verses 5 and 6 says, stubbornness and their unrepentant heart. They are treasuring up wrath in the day of wrath. And God will repay each person according to what they have done. So don't think that you, people have escaped the stuff that they did because they didn't get caught on this side. There's the other side that they're going to have to deal with. So just like the parable of the wheat and the tares, therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. So if we understand God is going to deal with the world, and he's also going to deal with us. Right. But with that being said, go down a few more couple of scriptures to verse number 47, which is the subject text of our text, of our sermon, which is Jesus' seventh parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon man that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. Which one, when it was full, they drew it to shore, they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. And there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So from the outskirts, it was seen that Jesus is addressing the same subject or the same thing that he was earlier. He technically is, but there's a subtle difference which and how the kingdom is being stressed. So from our text, consider for a moment, in church, but not in Christ. In church, but not in Christ. There's some people that are always in church, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're in Christ. Remember earlier when I said God's children are known by how they live. Just as Satan's children are known by how they live. So what I'm referring is you can be in church but not in Christ. Let me explain the parable and then it'll all come to clear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon man. So Jesus, of course, uses something common for the people to understand and knowledge they would be able to do. So Jesus uses something very simple to explain the truth. The dragon net um, is something that he knew his disciples would know and understand, especially what Peter, Andrew, James, and John, you remember they were fishermen. They stopped fishing just to follow Jesus. So the dragon net, without getting all, I mean, I read all that stuff, people just get too technical. It was a big old net, okay? Huge net. But the net had weights at each end. Well, at the bottom, basically. Weights at the bottom. And the weight was designed to drag the bottom of the sea. So as it dragged, it, it gathered all kind of fishes. Fishes. Ooh, 
that's not Fish. No, that's incorrect. My mom might hear this. Fish in the net. So, which we can understand why it's called the drag net. It dragged the bottom in order to get. So the drag net was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. So because the net was so huge, it dragged it on the bottom. That would mean that every conceivable kind of fish in that particular sea would be caught in this net. It ain't like they were um, sitting out by little, little, little uh, ponds and got them a, a jig and they were trying to find this <laughs> or got them a little bit of that little spinner thing and did all that. No, they call everything. So, let me show you what Jesus meant by the few symbols and this is going to start kicking in. We already know the symbolism of the dragon that will refer to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It spans all over. It is huge. And when it catches, it catches Everything, oh, we might as well say everybody. Because we can see, just from all of us, we got some latte, some cafe mochas in here. We got some deep red chop pot with no, uh, no additives, no preservatives. We got all kind of people that are in the church. So the symbol of the sea would be the world. So, the, of course, the drag net goes into the world, gets all kind of fish. So, therefore, that means the gospel is not indiscriminate toward anybody. The gospel is supposed to be spread to all the world, and that means it's gonna get all types of people in it. So, if we understand it's gonna get all types of people, where is it getting it to? So technically, the net also is, the gathering is the church. He's gathering all into the church of Christ. His church, it's his net. He's catching all kind of fish in his church. So, the most important part I want us to see is that the dragnet drags at the bottom of the sea. Now, that's the reason why I'm trying to get this, because some folks who think that some people that are the worst of the worst, and they would never respond to the gospel. Just like somebody thought about Jeffrey Dahmer could never be saved. Somebody knew, basically, he was at the bottom of the sea. And he wasn't worth anything. He would never be saved. Now, here's the reason why I always would have an issue with that. Because I remember somebody I hadn't seen in a long time. I was at Walmart. Of course, it was late. Should have known. And then one of the guys I had seen who we were in the military together, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he said, hey, bro, how you doing? I shook his hand. Still didn't remember his name until he finally said it. But he said, what you doing now, man? I said, he said, I ain't seen you at the gym lately. I said, man, I don't fool with the gym. But what you doing? I said, man. I now minister the gospel in um, in Clio, I preach the gospel in um, Clio. I'm a member of the Church of Christ since uh, April 23rd, 1993. And I remember the look he gave me. And it was just, it, he started laughing when he said, wait, wait, what? You saved. And I remember him saying, God drug the bottom of the ocean to come get you. <laughs> Even though we can joke like that, I didn't think about that until I was doing the lesson. I said, this man called me the bottom of the ocean. He didn't say the sea. You know, sea got a few thousand feet. But to understand, he knew where I was before Christ. And he said, man, if you can be saved, anybody can be saved. That's why you hear me say that, because he said it. Now, I haven't seen him literally. Have not seen him. Haven't found him on Facebook, because I don't remember his name. But it's just to say that some people realize, when even if you thought you was up here, the world still sees you as the bottom of the barrel. Yes. So if God can save you, if you think about the state that you were in, he can save anybody. So when I was going over the conversation in my head, I thought about it, I said, look at me now, I'm preaching the gospel, but some people be like, man, Rob preaches, <laughs> yeah. But here's the beauty, because I'm like, now I feel like I'm something worthy of something, here's why. If you want to be honest, in, 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 this, in my back in the day fishing days, but now what I call my eating days, I've come to believe that some of the best tasting fish that you will ever eat come from the bottom. Let, let me help some folks out, because some people don't understand this. Like, I don't eat that because they eat everything. It's at the bottom. Well, let me refresh your memory. There's something like halibut. Some of y'all may not know that, oh, yeah. but that's flounder. And then there's the favorite. Bass yeah. is a bottom feeder. Uh, uh, grouper, if you ain't never had some black and grouper. Oh, man. And some black and red snapper. Black snapper. Black snapper. 
But then people don't realize seven is a lot of fear. Yeah. Hold on. Ain't nothing like when you out in the country, you out fishing, you got a can of sardines with mustard or some extra ketchup. What's that? The red stuff, hot sauce. So what I'm saying is these are bottom things that you and I would eat, but guess what you eat? And then the notorious catfish. Ain't nothing like eating some fried catfish. Let's say talk about catfish. When, when it's bad right, when you got um, eyes, I don't want you to bad. Throw that stuff you in the it. You, you just put your fangs on it. We know when he put it in the grease, it's going to be good. Now, also, that means even the bottom fish that some stuff the other people won't eat, crab is a bottom fish. Oh, yeah. The reason I know because I love watching uh, the world that didn't miss catch. Uh -huh. We know that they got, it has to hit the bottom. Okay, keep moving. Then there's lobsters, shrimp, and scallops. So the worst stuff that people call the worst, you know it's the most expensive thing. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is just because something at the bottom don't mean it's no good. Because some of the best stuff comes from the bottom. So my point is God is not a respecter of persons. Neither is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have to be willing to go and talk to everybody. Because you have to look at yourself and realize, I wasn't nothing, but I'm somebody in God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon that was cast into the sea, gathered of some of every kind. Which, when it was full, they drew it to shore, they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels. But they threw the bad away. So it's at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just, and the cast into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So at the end of the world, Jesus' angels will come and separate the good from the bad. So what I want you to see is, the gospel is going to bring in, or we'll say, gather the good and the bad, the ungodly and the godly into the church. So there's going to be some bad people in the church, but not necessarily in Christ. There may even be some good people in the church, but it don't take good people to get to heaven. It has to be in Christ to get to heaven. So if we see by what Jesus explaining that there's going to be a separation at the end of the world. So everyone, this is, if you look at it, Jesus is saying, everyone who has obeyed that form of doctrine, has been baptized for the remission of their sins is in the church. But he's also informed us that everybody ain't in him. Think about this now. We don't know the hearts of people, but what we do know is we see what we see. But Jesus is telling you, we're talking about the church. Everybody that's in church ain't going to heaven because everybody ain't in him. So that means everyone in the Church of Christ has been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just as we know that not everyone is yielding to or trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit either. So if you ain't trying to be filled with it, guess what else you ain't filled with? It? You ain't filled with Christ. So there's something I should have brought out earlier. The word bad in verse number 48. The word bad in the text means corrupt or rotten. When he infers that word, that means... When first folks first heard the gospel, they obeyed, were baptized for mission of sin, they were good people. They were genuine and sincere in their faith. But in the process of time, they became bad. If you had an apple, an orange, a banana, and a tomato, and you let it sit out and you do nothing to it, what's it going to do? It's going to go bad. So what he's saying is, everyone starts. In this text, he said, everyone that got baptized at the end, the end. They started out good. But the word bad means they became corrupt or they became rotten. So he's inferring that, that they don't live up to the standards of the kingdom. And gradually, they turn away from their first love. He gave you the, 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 the parable of the seeds. Some of them, they fell on a certain ground, and soon as something happened, sun came down, burned them, gone. Then another one, uh, was it rocky? It, 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 it gets consumed by weeds. We know the other one gets taken away, but what I want you to see is, there was a different type of heart. She thinks everybody's not going to stay when they hear the word. 
everyone's not going to do right when they hear the word. So just because folks keep coming back to church every time the third doors of the church are open don't mean that they're in Christ. But they are in church. So we may know that people are in church, but we may never know who is or who is not in Christ. You could be sitting next to someone who you, man, you remember the rich, everybody thought that the rich, um, the rich man was going to make it to heaven. But he was kind of perplexed when he woke up and his eyes was in torment. Looks up and see who you, so Jesus flipped the script and said, who you think is going to make it to heaven ain't really who's going to go. But who you don't know is probably is who's going to go. So we have to be careful about who we think and what we think. So in my train of thought, there's a difference between church folk and Christians. I know I've said this before, but I need to make sure you understand. There's some folk who just come to church. That's what they do. And then there's some folks who are Christians. So there's a noticeable difference between the church folk and Christians by their behavior. Just because somebody goes to church, you can tell who they really are sometimes while you're in church. Church will act godly at specific places, at specific times. You know that mask they be putting on? It's, it's, uh, it's Sunday school mask. Take it off. It's church mask. Take it off. It's Wednesday night mask. Take it off. I got to go deal with these folks at the, uh, at the hospital. We put my hospital mask on. They put their game face on for the Lord on the Lord's day. So they're going to act godly at a certain time. But Christians act godly all the time. They only have one life to live, and that's of the Christian life. So we don't know. I think it was LaFonce this morning. You know a tree by its fruit. Luke 6, chapter, verses 14 through 45. So you don't have to judge anybody, but you can tell. If you keep doing this, and apparently you ain't too much in Christ, but when you show in the church, church folk make an effort to be and look better than other folk. They're so caught up in their outward appearance that they try to make themselves look better than everyone else. They try to have this really Christian look. They walk around with three Bibles, two big crosses, stuff all, uh, all kinds of scriptures everywhere. It don't take all that. But the Christian makes an effort to be more like Jesus. The church folk are religious. They're, they worship. They follow Jesus only on the Lord's day. While Christians worship and make themselves to be a disciple every day. So there's some people that would look like disciples of Christ only on Sunday and Wednesday night versus the Christian who's trying to live and look like the disciple of the Lord every day. So which means, excuse me, the Christian looks like the Christian on Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night. You know, when you get paid, just got paid, it's Friday night. Okay, y'all go to song. But <laughs> church folk, I'm, I'm trying to help you see Behavior that'll give you away to the church folk. Church folk will always see things from their own negative perspective. They, they have this negative mindset, so when they see things, when they see situations and they see conditions, they see it in a negative light. So in other words, if they see something that ain't really what it is, they'll start talking about it. They become whisperers. Y'all see how long y'all died? You see it up to 1.8 seconds. It was like 2.3 seconds. Y'all don't believe it that somebody can tell you that you hug somebody too long? I'm telling you. I've been there and done that. So what I'm saying is, to the Christian, they make sure that they see it from a different light. They may see something they're not even thinking about. Because you know that one sister coming, you're supposed to hug a sister from the side. This is the Christian hug. If you don't get up out of my face with that four sisters. <coughs> now, this is Sister Ruth who's 80-something years old. I don't know Sister Ruth the wrong. I'm hugging Sister Ruth like I do my mom. But this woman told me that don't look Christian. And I was a choir, and again, I'll tell you, I was young in the faith. I'll just keep using that excuse. I just told her she can leave and get on back on 51 and go back home. Don't come up here trying to tell me how to hug somebody. I almost said the name, but I see some folks on cloud I know what I'm talking about. So, which means the Christian thinks to the pure, all things are pure. But here's the trip part. The church folk are those who are defied and unbelieving. Nothing is pure. So stop seeing stuff that ain't really there. The reason why you see it is because that's probably the life that you live. So now you're seeing things from your negative perspective because you either used to do it or still don't. Matter of fact, to the pure, all things are pure, but those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure.
But even their mind and their consciousness is defiled. Told you when this starts here, you see everything else the wrong way. They profess to know God, but in works, they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. Church folk love to argue about opinions, traditions, and preferences. That's some stuff. Y'all better not be clapping in that. Man, if you don't get up out here with that foolishness. Arguing over things that have nothing to do with salvation. And those same people will get out, as I said last week, supposed to be Christians, will get out there in the world and start arguing about a flag and whether or not you need to be. When they need to be telling them, you're going, there's going to come a day with every knee shall bow. Instead of worrying about something like that. The Christian will avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels about the law. Why? Because they understand that they are unprofitable and useless. Titus 3rd chapter verse number 9. Church folk always got to be right. Y'all ever thought about that? It don't make a difference what's going on. Two plus two is four. They said it's five. They will show you some kind of math and try to justify two plus two is five. You just missed something. They got to be right about everything while the Christian makes an effort to just be righteous. It's not about being right. It's about being righteous. Church folk will hold grudges for years. Think about this now. We talk about the things that the world does. If someone in the church is still holding a grudge, there's something wrong with them. The Christians will forgive and keep on moving. I didn't say forgive and forget. That's a lie. Because if you don't remember what they did to you before, they bound to repeat it again. So, church folk will speak evil about you. They will lie on you. Church folk will gossip about you. Church folk will kill your reputation. Church folk will assassinate your character. And sometimes they don't even mean to, but they talk so much. Yeah, check, 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 check. That that's what they're doing. The Christian will only speak that which is good to the use of edifying. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4, 29. Notice, he's saying edifying. So if you're talking bad about the pumps, you're not edifying. You're telling us that you're church folk. Because if you're in Christ, you're going to edify when you say something. So we're going to talk about, somebody going to talk about the pumps? Let me tell you about the pumps. Even when his coffin, he still be saying well, he drive, what he said, they told him he drive 400 miles to sing one song. That's somebody in church. Don't sound like they in Christ. Church folk are like Jonah in the beginning. They don't want to go evangelize. They don't want to be, they want to select who and when they choose who should or should not receive the gospel. You can't get church folk to come out and listen. Y'all, let's go do something. Well, I see what I'm doing. Well, we're going to have something in the church. I, I'll see if I want to come out this Saturday. You ain't doing that. You want to do it last Saturday. Uh, you, you probably ain't going to do nothing this Saturday. It's free food. Well, uh, I see what I... Church folk don't want to come and be around folk that will encourage them to do right on Saturday morning. They don't want to share the gospel because you can't get them to say, can we go... Do I have to wear a shirt? I can't find my Church of Christ shirt. It don't make a difference. Finding excuses why not to share the gospel. It's church folk. Whereas the Christian will go eat to all of, in all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. That's what the Christian wants to do. Church folk will judge you, condemn you. Church folk will tell you everything that you're doing wrong and tell you what you should and should not be doing. The whole while doing the same thing they're telling you not to do. Somebody act like a little bit. Read Romans, second chapter, verses one through three. Folk that harp on this one thing all the time, you know, like you're doing the same thing as what the Bible says. So in other words, they never take the beam out of their own eye while they're trying to correct someone else who has a little mold right. in their life. Right. The Christian would not judge you. What they're going to do is first let me remove the beam out of my own eye before I even try to come to you and tell you about the little moments in your eye. That's how the Christian is. Brothers and sisters, here's what I'm trying to get to understand is that there's some folks that are in the church who display church behavior, but they don't display in Christ's behavior. Church folk will do stuff to you 
me say this on this side because I've been on that. Church folk would do stuff for you and then turn around and throw it up in your face and let you know how much they've done for you. How many people like for people to, to throw up in your face what they've done for you? Now, here's the thing. The only reason why they throw up in your face is because you didn't do what they asked you to do. You couldn't take them where they wanted you to go. I need you to do something for me, but you can't do it. So what do they do? They throw it up. That's what church folk do. They throw it up in your face. Church folk, when they throw it up in your face, they don't care if you got a broken arm or broken leg, but they want you to come move some furniture in the house. Somebody did somebody missed that. Oh, yeah. They don't care if you had eye surgery yesterday and you got two patches on both sides that you couldn't drive them to the store. That makes sense now, though, because I'm telling you that the people, church folk will throw stuff, I did all this and I did all that. Well, why don't you do it if you're going to throw it back up in my face? You do it because of love. Don't do it so you can remind me of what you did, so you can try to guilt me, because I'm the wrong person to try to get me to do something. Because now I say, you know what, you showed me, and I'm going to start writing it down, so the next time you say it, I'm just going to show it to you. So you can say, you got to say it again. You remember you told me that thing on uh, October the 8th, 2017, around about 1142, yes, when you told me, don't bring that one up. I got that on the list. The Christian, Luke 6, 35, here's what they'll do when they do it. They do good, lend, Hoping for nothing in return. That's what the Christian does. If I'm going to do something for you, I'm doing it because I want to do it. I have no reason to throw it back up in your face because now you didn't do what I want you to do. Well, why do you do it without asking for anything in return? Because they know that the reward will be great and they will be sons of the most high. People who are church folk, the world knows that you're church folk too because guess what? They've heard you bring up in their face what you did for them. So, children, God's children, are known by how they live and their behavior. Just as Satan's children are known by how they live and their behavior. So basically, what I'm trying to say about church folk. Church folk, well, most church folk, probably 98.9% .9 of the chance, they're just hypocrites. And their behavior is really no different than the folks in the world. That long list of stuff I just said, they're still doing the same thing. And they started out good, but they just started going right back to the same. They just still continue doing it through the works of the flesh. But here's the sad part about it. They have been enlightened. Well, once enlightened, that being Hebrews 6, 4, and 5. Once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the power just of age to come. Yet, they still want to go back to being the way they used to be. So, what they fail to understand is that if you are in church, but not in Christ, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. That's something that we need to understand. It's okay, yeah, you come to church. That's a good thing. But you have to be in Christ, which means there has to be a behavior that's associated. In other words, we can put on a show for everybody else, but God knows who you really are. So if you're not who you really say you are, I promise you, just as you think you can get away with it, somebody sees you. So you may be in church, but that doesn't necessarily mean you are in Christ. Matter of fact, we're going to end because I see the time. Here's the thing. Let's be honest. We still talk about church folk. We know that some of church folk are some of the meanest, most hateful, low down, evil, and most difficult people in the world to deal with. And this is before you became a Christian. You just talk about so called church folk on your job. They are the most hypocritical the most judgmental, condemning, 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 condescending, slick mouth jokers you will ever meet. It's church folk. And the thing is, those are the same ones that go to church every Sunday and every time the church doors open. Well, Christians, they live according to the fruit of the Spirit. 
And here's what's sad about this church, to these church folk. They don't realize or care that their behavior brings Christ to an open shame. And it ultimately gives God and Christianity a bad name. Because their life, if you're a Christian, and that's how, then why do I need to become a member of the Lord's church if that's how you're living? That's why I said some of the most foolish stuff happens with so people who claim to be Christians and they ain't nothing but church folk. Because there's a whole bunch of people out there in the world that think they're in Christ, but they go to church every Sunday. Guess what? If they ain't in Christ, they are not on their way to heaven. So my brothers and sisters, this is why folk say, I love Jesus. I love God, but I hate the church. And I've heard him in my own, what you mean? Man, half the men, the things that church folk, man. Just like I'm using the same word, they use the same word. So we have to make sure that we are not behaviors of church folk, but behaviors of that who is in Christ. And the reason why folks say that they hate church and hate church folk is because they are witnesses to folks who are in church, but not in Christ. So being in the church is good. Being in the church is good. Don't ever let me tell you being in the church is not good. Because that's what helped me get into Christ is because I started being in the church. Third, the third row from the back left hand side, being in the church. My friend Isaac, being in the church. And he and I, we can look at each other and say, we was at the bottom of the sea together. We know how, what we used to feed on. But look where God lives you, not yourself, but where God puts you. So if he can turn a thug into a, theolo into a theologian, which is Peter, he can change you to be something else Amen. even better. Amen. So being in church is good. That's benefits that come with being in the congregation. And it's just wonderful to be in a church on this side of life. Because you can say, I'm a part of Southside. But being in Christ is better. Because mm -hmm. you know there's better benefits not only on this side, but there's a benefit of being on the other side. Because when you're in Christ, you're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Romans 3, chapter verse 24. Romans 8, 1. Let you know that therefore there is no more condemnation because you're in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter verse number 2. We're sanctified in Christ Jesus. We're called to be saints. 1 Corinthians 1 chapter, verse number 30. We are made unto the wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption because we're in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. We have hope because we're in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 chapter, verse number 17. We are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new because we are in Christ. Christ. Galatians 3rd chapter verse 28. All of us are one in Jesus Christ. There's no, no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no bond, no sin. Everybody can be one in Christ Jesus. This is 1st chapter verse number 3. We all, because of any being in Christ, we get all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. This is 2nd chapter verse number 13. We are all made near by the blood of Jesus Christ because we are in Christ. And 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter verses 16 and 17 lets us know when you're in Christ, the dead in Christ shall rise first and shall always be with the Lord. So being in Christ is important. Everyone who's in the church right now needs to examine themselves to see if they are in Christ. This is something that only you can sit back and think about. Notice all those vocabulary words, all those adjectives that I describe to people in the world. Do you fit that description? When people see you, then they say, oh, that's, that's what the church for. They don't say that's one of the Christians. Folk will label you, but you don't even realize that they're labeling you. They say, oh, they're one of the church, they come to church folk. They don't say he come to Christians. That's a sign that they consider you church folk and not Christians. If you're not a child of God, then you need to know that you are already physically, already not in Christ. You know that you're not. You are physically in the church now, but you're not spiritually in the church, nor are you spiritually in Christ either. So you can remedy that situation. Your spiritual condition can be changed by believing the gospel. I mentioned earlier the gospel is that Jesus Christ is, that he is the Son of God. Jesus Christ 
came from heaven down this earth, knowing what he had to do in order for us to be saved. Died on that cruel cross, rise again on the third day according to the scriptures. You believe that, do you have to repent of your sins? Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and go in the water grave of baptism where you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will help and guide you and keep you not only in the church, but it help and guide you and keep you in Christ as well. But if you're a child of God and you know and you realize that your lifestyle and behavior only shows that you are in church, but not in Christ, you need to repent of your sins, get back to the fellowship of God. So if anyone needs to respond to this invitation, may do so as we stand and sing a song of encouragement. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to me. 